Well, good morning to participants uh, joining from London and good afternoon to those of you in um, Moscow or in Russia. And uh, welcome to the latest in the series of embassy outreach events organized by the RBCC, in which the embassy team kindly provide us, the British business community, with an update on events. For those who don't know me, my name's Alf Torrance. I'm the executive director of the RBCC, and I'm delighted to welcome Julia Crouch, deputy head of mission, and Trevor Lewis, director for the DIT Russia. Thank you, of course, to all RBC members and friends for joining us today for what's the first, uh, our first webinar this year. We have been moving towards offline events, but given the importance of events happening at the moment, we wanted to get something together quickly. And given some concerns about Omicron, we thought the best way of doing so would be by another webinar online. These outreach events started with the outbreak of coronavirus about two years ago, and I believe this is the eighth we've organized with the embassy, but the very first with the deputy head of mission in the hot seat. So on behalf of all the participants, I'd like to thank Julia and Trevor for taking the time to speak to, to, to us today in what I know is a very, very busy period, and I know it's absolutely appreciated by all of us. After I've finished, I'll invite Julia to make a few opening remarks, and then we'll move straight into q and I've received a number of written questions, which I'll try and get through as best I can, but please feel free to ask more questions using the chat room function. And if you'd like to ask them direct, um, do so, but please use the hand up function on the Zoom app to indicate that you want to ask a question and I'll cue you. Today's webinar is slightly shorter than usual. Uh, we have 40 minutes, um, so we've got a lot to get through, so we'll get going now. Um, Julia, so much to talk about, but three, theme, three themes stand out from our conversations with our members. That's Ukraine, Omicron, and medical checks. Fascinated to hear your insights. The floor is yours. Great, thank you very much indeed. Um, so thanks, Al, for, for the introduction, and it's a it's a great opportunity actually to be able to speak to the business community both to communicate what we understand of the situation but as importantly to hear um, your views and concerns so that we can reflect those back um, to to london as well um, starting with ukraine um, obviously everybody will have been watching um, with concern the build-up of troops along the border between russia um, and Ukraine. Um, our assessment is that, that the level of troop buildup is such that it is um, uh, part of planning for an invasion. That's not to say that a final decision has been taken, but it is at a level where we think the troops could be sent into Ukraine. And that's obviously a huge, huge um, concern. Um, the embassy and indeed ministers in London are focusing on the diplomatic route to try and find a solution um, to this that doesn't involve Russia launching such an invasion, but also at the same time to signal very clearly the consequences um, if Russia were to take that step. I mean, obviously, it would be a disaster for um, both Russia and Ukraine in terms of the economic impact, but the lives that would be lost through through such a conflict. So um, part of that response is also about uh, thinking about sanctions, and you will have seen um, in the papers um, that uh, the government has uh, focused on developing a new package or a broader range of sanctions, a broader power to impose sanctions. Um, I won't be able to go into a huge amount of detail about exactly who will be sanctioned or which companies, but the aim of the, the new package is to um, uh, broaden the scope to ensure that they are as effective as possible as a deterrent um, against um, any form of military aggression. Um, so that's probably the overview in terms of Ukraine. Um, in terms of Omicron, um, again, we are watching this very closely. It's, it's clearly a, a big concern. Um, that the the rise in case numbers from Omicron is is has risen it has risen so steeply and it's something obviously that we've also seen in the UK. Um, it's too soon, I think, to know what it will mean for hospitalizations. Obviously, in the UK, we've happily seen that that the um, the number of deaths and serious hospitalizations has been much less thanks to thanks to vaccination. Um, vaccination rates in, in, in Russia and in Moscow have obviously gone up quite a lot over the last few months. They're not quite at UK levels. 
Um, but we hope that that and the fact that so many people have had Omicron means that the impact on hospitalisation uh, will not be as severe as, as it was in the first wave. But I think it's too early at the moment to, to be sure of that. So we are, we are watching. Um, I don't know if people have got questions about travel advice, but both in relation to Omicron um, and in relation to the situation in, uh, in Ukraine, we're not proposing at this point to change travel advice. Um, I know that the US have changed their travel advice into, into Russia. Um, I think that reflects in part their situation being very, very um, short, uh, low staffed and their ability therefore to deal with consular cases. We're not in that position. And as I say, I think we're not anticipating any immediate change to, to travel advice. Um, and then the final question I think was on um, health checks, which I know is a massive concern um, to people. We are engaging with the Russian authorities on that. Um, and unless Trevor wants to add anything extra to that, I, 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 I can't really update very much more other than to say we absolutely hear you on that and your concern and have been passing on those concerns very strongly to, to the Russian government. So that's probably all I'll yep. say by way of introduction, if that's enough, and then I will get to the to the to the questions that people. Might yeah, no, thank you very much, Julia. And and I'll just say for uh, I know a lot of people came in slightly late. Um, I have a list of questions put um, to me or put to the uh, to to the team um, um, by by yourselves. But if you want to ask any other questions, please do so using the chat room function. And and you're more than welcome to ask uh, questions direct to either Julia or Trevor. Um, using the hand up function uh, again. So I'll, uh, that will allow me to cue you if you want to ask those questions direct. Anyways, um, thank you very much, Julia, for that. Um, that's a great overview. Um, I think we'll go straight into QA and A now. I'm going to start off with one of those uh, questions that are uppermost in, in the business community's uh, minds. And that is, it's from Stuart Lawson from EY. And he asks, um, if we sanction the oligarchs, et cetera, in the UK, what's the impact? the potential impact on UK business and individuals operating in Russia, given the stated reciprocity position of the Russians uh, and combined with the, uh, the recent Duma legislation for expropriating business um, for businesses and people deemed anti-Russian. Um, I suppose that could go to either of you. Um, Trevor, would you like to kick off given that um, um, Julia's made the opening remarks? Yeah, thanks, Alf. I mean, Judy may want to, to flesh it out, but, but but obviously we are conscious of this. Uh, we're aware, obviously, that uh, in the previous cases where sanctions have been, been introduced, that the Russians have reciprocated in some shape or form. But it's speculation, really, because I don't think we, A, we know that whether we would actually have to introduce our own sanctions and B, therefore, whether the Russians would reciprocate. So I think it's very much a watching brief on that for now. And obviously we are keeping a close eye on that, but I'll, I'll defer to Julia if she wants to go into a bit more detail on that. Thanks. Yeah, I think unfortunately it's, it's always difficult to to know exactly how the Russians will will respond. But uh, as you say, reciprocity is a key principle of their foreign policy. Um, but also sometimes asymptomatic or a, uh, asymmetric, sorry, responses. So um, it's not always clear on how they will respond. Um, I'm conscious that sometimes they have a list of people who are not able then to enter Russia, but they don't publish the name. So. Um, I totally understand why it's a it's a source of anxiety. Um, if we have any insights as to, to to what the likely response will be, and we're able to share it, then obviously we will. But I think it's it's something that London are mindful of when they when they make these decisions that there you know that there could be consequences. Thank you very much. Um, and and just um, th this is a conversation. So if uh, when you've asked a question, if you want to follow it up, please do uh, using the chat room function. Um, next question is, is again on, on business, and um, uh, this one <coughs> is, is definitely more for Trevor. What's your prognosis for 2022 uh, um, with respect to business opportunities between Russia and the UK? Well, I think you know me, Alf, and a lot of the people on the call know me, so I'm always sort of in a glass half full on this. So, um, so, so, so you know, assuming things don't go go terribly wrong, you know, we have a very active plan of business engagement plan for uh, the next few months and and beyond. In fact, I asked the team to produce a list for me uh, just before I came up. So I think we've got about 
20 events planned between now and the end of March, either ones that we're organising ourselves or in partnership with, with some of the people indeed on this call. So there's legal, interior design, accounting, education, more legal, electronic vehicles, education again, pharmaceuticals, green finance, waste operations, uh, again, waste, hydrogen, uh, financial services, food and drink, construction, in particular green building, uh, and um, some more uh, actually to do with um, treatment, specialist treatments around HIV prevention. So again, back into the healthcare market. So I think hopefully that gives you and your members and, and other people who've joined today a sort of sense that we do have a very ambitious program that we're keen to deliver. Uh, these are all sectors where we see huge opportunities potentially for, for British companies to do business here. So if the overarching sort of, you know, uh, environment atmosphere allows us to deliver that, then we'll deliver all of those events. Of course, if things don't quite work out that way and they do go wrong then obviously we would look to uh, look at which events are practical and, and indeed whether you know many of these will actually take place so i'm hoping fingers crossed that, all, that they all do take place as you can see it's, it's there it's supporting you know a very wide spectrum of different businesses in different sectors and that's what we want to do and that's what we have been doing uh, and that's what's already planned for now again if we're allowed to we're at the end of our financial year now our, our financial year sort of you know, starts from first of april so that's the end of this year which is why there's usually a, a bit of a sort of flush of activity but what we're also doing now is planning uh, our activity for, for for the rest of the financial year for the new financial year and again that will be quite ambitious we'll be working with colleagues in london and istanbul where our funding comes from to secure funding to put on more events across similar sectors perhaps new sectors with a view to having a very active engagement policy on the business side all the way through again until the end of the next financial year so that's all there the enthusiasm's there you'll hopefully see that the energy's there unfortunately i can't control the environment but if i'm able to uh, deliver those events me and the team obviously working with yourselves and British Business Club and other partners are on here today are very keen to do so. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Trevor, for that uh, optimistic uh, view in a, when it's most needed, I suspect. Um, th this, this is a question which, which I'm sure is, is weighing on, on a lot of people's minds. And uh, it is, do you see or can you foresee um, a circumstance if the um, tension with the Ukraine or, or over the Ukraine situation increases? Do you see a situation where the embassy would recommend UK citizens leaving Russia? Um, so I think that's highly, I think that's highly unlikely. Um, at the moment, as I said in the intro, we're not we're not looking at changing our travel advice. Um, obviously, um, for the for, for citizens who are who are in Ukraine, that's a different situation. That's the country that's potentially. Um, seeing an invasion but for russia we hope that that there wouldn't be a need to advise people to leave russia oh, i mean yeah. we would have to we would have to look very very carefully uh, you know if there was suddenly an uptick if, if the uk was suddenly portrayed in the russian media as being um an enemy as, as a participant in the conflict or something and the, and the environment were to change very seriously then obviously we would review it but what i'm hearing from uh, business people around Russia, and we, we, we've touched in with colleagues in Sakhalin as well, is that at the moment, people are not feeling that they are particularly at threat. And I've not seen any particular threats to UK nationals or UK businesses. Um, so at the moment, we don't anticipate that we'll be asking people to, to leave Russia. Great. I'll recommend that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's very clear. Um, next question is, I mean, it's been very good news about the relaxation or, or, or the sort of restructuring of the um, the rules for entering the UK. Um, but, but I suppose the, the next step is, and, and this is what the question is about, will the UK accept Sputnik vaccination certificates anytime soon? Um, and couldn't the UK, uh, given that we're not in the EU anymore, make that decision unilaterally? So the easy part of that question is, yes, the UK could make that decision because we're not in the EU, EU anymore. Yeah. Um, at the moment, um, I mean, which vaccination certificates are, are accepted is definitely kept under under review. The easiest thing, obviously, would be if Russia provided all the paperwork to the World Health Organization to enable the World, World Health Organization to um, recognize Sputnik. Um, at the moment, we are, the UK is only um, accepting certification of vaccines that are recognized by the WHO because the WHO is obviously an objective organization with the scientific expertise to do so. Um, and the difficulty is that neither the WHO or the European Medical Association has had all the paperwork from Russia um, 
to satisfy them um, about the production of the vaccine and the quality of the production of the vaccine. And that's the thing that's been the obstacle. Um, so, yeah, in theory, yes, but in practice, I think the UK has, has been waiting for Russia to provide the necessary paperwork to the WHO. And I hope that will happen very soon because I appreciate the, uh, the impact on real people's lives at the moment of the difficulty of not having that. Great, um, thank you very much. Um, staying off Ukraine for a, a second or two, um, the next question is on the um, health checks, um, which are um, at the moment, uh, foreigners are a little bit unclear on whether they have to um, carry them out every three months. Have you got any information on that? Or c can you uh, um, give your, the, the embassy's um, um, perspective on it, please? Um, so we have lobbied the Russian government on this. Um, I, I am not aware, but I will turn to Trevor because I know he's been following the detail of any changes on this. If there's any, if there's been any uh, indication of, of a significant change. Trevor, do you want to pick up that question? Yeah, no, no, nothing in terms of change that I'm aware of, but you're absolutely right, Julie. We have raised this. We've raised it locally, obviously, with, uh, with, with the government through the MFA. Uh, and uh, we've also raised it uh, with the Russian embassy in London to make sure they're aware. And, and I'm pretty conscious that that's been recognised by, by lots of people in the system who, who understand it. Probably not the best thing to do if you want to attract you know, more businesses and people to invest here. But I'm not aware there's been a change of the decision, but they are aware of the concerns. Of course, it's not just us, as you're aware of, because I think you've been involved in some of the work here with the Association of European Businesses who've raised it. I know from speaking to colleagues in other embassies that uh, other embassies have also raised it bilaterally. So there's there's a sort of, you know, uh, quite a lot of momentum and lots of people basically expressing their concerns about this. So I'm sure it will be uh, recognised and registered. Quite how it's uh, it's dealt with is a different matter, but I think it, the business community has made it very clear that this is not a very good idea. In fact, we'll, we'll put people off doing business here rather than attract them if that's what your uh, objective is. So, so it's definitely registered, definitely recognised as a concern, but exactly how the Russian government decide to deal with it, of course, is, it's for them to decide. Thanks. Yeah. Um, if I may, I'll just add a bit on that, because as Trevor mentioned, um, all the business organizations are currently involved in in lobbying the, the Russian government on this. Um, uh, essentially, you know, that message has, has gone over loud and clear. And um, I think there's an appreciation that the, the legislation needs to be changed. Um, obviously, it's not only the business organizations that are approaching um, the government. Uh, lots of the big corporates have their own legal departments which are doing so as well and i think where we are at the moment is there's an acceptance that it will be um not every three months it will be a year but unfortunately because the legislation was enacted very quickly there wasn't a total tie-up between the various ministries and um for it to officially <clears throat> become one year uh, would require one of the ministries to admit that, that they had got it wrong or misread the, the legislation. So it, it, it's slightly stuck at the moment. That said, um, there has been official, well, um, the answer given an official capacity to um, some of the organizations is that it's not three months. Um, however, it, it really depends um, on, on who you talk to or which ministry uh, you approach. So. Um, as Trevor said, we're still waiting for the, the absolute official response, but th there's a, you know, a strong case for optimism that, that it will um, change in the not too distant future. Okay, um, thank you. I just thought I'd add that because we, we, we've been um, at the call face on, on the question and um, um, I know it's uh, uh, of a great concern to, to a lot of people. Right, the next question is, uh, let's have a look. Um, is Russia open for business, Trevor? Yeah, I mean, very much so. I mean, and again, most of the people on on this call will, will know Russia very well. Uh, they'll know, you know, the, the, the complications of doing business here and, uh, and in many cases doing business here and done it very, very successfully. I think where we where we find it a bit more difficult from a, from a DIT perspective, and again the, the, the current situation sort of perhaps reinforces that, is where there's lots of uh, negative media uh, sort of coverage and commentary, and if you watch the news, you know it's it's a very sort of high profile issue on the news. Where we find that a little bit more challenging in my role is when we're trying to attract new British companies to come and, and look at Russia. So if you're a, if you're an SME based in uh, you know sort of one of the sort of you know centres of business in the UK or somewhere more rural, and you're looking at markets that 
that you might want to explore and all you hear about Russia is sanctions and uh, you know the political situation then it makes it much more difficult to, to attract and let people to come in when we actually get them here um, and they come and visit themselves which is a great first step then of course you know in many cases they're absolutely wowed by Moscow and St Petersburg and the business opportunities and the people they meet I say the challenge we have is actually uh, getting them here but certainly in terms of Russia being open for business yes and the companies that you know many of you on here uh, know Russia know that they can do good business here and in many cases do it what I'd like to see is more British companies coming over to see for themselves but obviously the, <laughs> the current uh, situation isn't very conducive to that but hopefully as we were saying earlier on as things improve we might be able to attract more companies here and what I'd like to be able to do a little bit more which is which has been a bit awkward but uh, is working perhaps with uh, you know Russian uh, colleagues based in the UK is a little bit more outreach and some of the stuff that you know we've been talking about out in terms of uh, forums and business seminars and stuff that we do with DIT across the region to actually uh, share the message that Russia is a potentially a very good place for people to do business uh, and that's the message that sometimes get lost so certainly with there's plenty of Russian businesses I speak to who want to do business with the UK the challenge I have to a certain extent is actually getting particularly new companies uh, to come and see for themselves thanks great thank you very much Trevor um, just a, a follow-up uh, to, to one of the earlier questions on Sputnik. Um, uh, Helen Lloyd from uh, St. Petersburg uh, adds um, sh that uh, she uh, understands that the WHO will review Sputnik at the end of February, early March. Um, does, does, can the embassy have any sort of information to corroborate that? Uh, is, is that your understanding? So I've just put something briefly in the chat in answer oh, to Helen's just questions. No, I just oh, missed right. it. Just missed it. Sorry, yeah. um, okay. So I haven't seen the WHO representative in the last couple of weeks, but we do keep fairly closely in touch with them. And there's been a long-standing issue of, of WHO not receiving the paperwork that they needed. Um, but Helen's right, there will be a further... And they, who did announce at the beginning of the year that they had now... I think uh, Peskov, first of all, admitted that the Russians had misunderstood understood the, the situation and hadn't sent the paperwork. Then we had a statement by the WHO that, that, that they had now received some paperwork. I'm not sure if they got it all. Once they've got that, I know they would want to do a further review um, before deciding whether to approve Sputnik. So I very much hope now that they have got what they need and that process will uh, will conclude. But we have heard that quite a lot of times over the last few months. So. I think until I, I wouldn't necessarily count all my chickens until we until we know that that process has happened. Right. But it's a sh shame because it would help everybody to have another very good vaccine on the market. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay, we, we have uh, just over fifteen minutes left. Um, I'm I'm rattling through these questions, so there will be time for others. So please. Um, use the chat room to ask those. And again, if you want to ask them direct, you can do that by using the hand up function. Um, two more questions now, uh, both slightly more political, but relevant to the conversation given the crisis is political. Um, the first one is from David Gardner, a longstanding member of the chamber. And, and he asks, what's preventing the UK from inviting Russia back into the uh, uh, newly constituted G8? Um, he, and, he, and his view, actions to isolate Russia uh, um, is putting us backwards, is taking us backwards rather than forwards is, is the essence of the question. So basically uh, admitting Russia back into the G8. Um, well, I think a fundamental obstacle to admitting Russia back into the G8 is the events of Salisbury in which a British woman uh, lost her life. Um, the UK has not received any cooperation or even recognition of that from Russia. Um, and I think that remains a very fundamental obstacle actually to admitting Russia back into the international community and into the into the G8. We, we, it's difficult to work with a country that um, uh, carries out those sorts of acts in breach of its international obligations, uses, uses chemical weapons on the state of another country and, and uh, you know, leading to the death of of our citizens and long-term, long-term profound implications for a police officer as well. So I think that that is a fundamental problem. Okay, thank you. Um, probably stay, stay away from those at the moment. Um, the next one, again, more relevant to the um, Ukraine. And um, the, the question is, um, why is there so little talk about fulfilling the Minsk agreement? Um, interesting question, obviously. Um, probably Julia again. <clears throat> yeah, so so I think 
there are talks there are talks about the Minsk agreement there are there are multiple levels of uh, engagement going on um, involving all sorts of uh, partners European partners the UK has had um, slightly less of a role on Minsk France and Germany are particularly involved in uh, in discussing that so there is there is discussion about that but not everything that's discussed is necessarily in the in the public domain sometimes um, conversations um, are more effective if they're if they're done not not uh, in the in the spotlight but I think minx is is a difficult you know is a difficult uh, treaty to uh, to to take forward and I think um, you know there are some there are some quite profound difficulties for Ukraine in implementing mm -hmm. aspects of mints but but that's not to say that conversations are not happening I think they are great thank you um, okay let's move slightly back to business I suppose um, one for Trevor and the question is do you see any silver lining uh, in this uh, cloud of uncertainty? Um, and I suppose really, where do you see areas we can work together and, and uh, perhaps uh, opportunities for, for UK and Russia business to, to thrive in, in this slightly tense time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, as I was saying before, Alf, in terms of our own sort of, you know, projection of work and, and where we want to do things with Russia, that, that there's plenty out there. So, so, you know, a very good silver lining there if, you know the circumstances has allow us to do that so so lots of energy as you're aware up until fairly recently and over the last couple of years we've managed to get ministers involved uk ministers which hadn't happened for a long while so so things were actually beginning to move in the right direction unfortunately now we're taking quite a big step backwards but obviously that's beyond, beyond my control but uh, as i say if, if the circumstances allow there's plenty of appetite uh, you know to, to do more business and get more companies here and, and basically share with people what the opportunities might be and we know there's a good resident you know british business community here and good uh, sort of russian businesses that we do a lot of uh, you know a lot with uh, we can build on that quite successfully it would be around a range of sectors i went through that uh, list earlier on and, and you know as you can see it's quite extensive and, and, and quite broad uh, and in fact we're introducing some new services uh, from, from april onwards um, basically to help uh, particularly first-time exporters to russia uh, help them navigate through the system um, so we'll put some of our resources towards that uh, in terms of advising companies who've never been here before how they do it taxes visas all that type of thing so so plenty there so yeah the silver lining exists if we can actually see it through the cloud so i guess that would be my point on that uh, just 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 one follow-up point on on julia's uh, comments earlier on around uh, the consular just just a sort of general sort of practical point here and again Julia's absolutely right I mean no suggestion whatsoever of changing the travel advice or thinking the situation is going to get um, you know particularly uh, desperate here for, for British nationals but I think as a general rule wherever we are in the world whenever sort of situation gets a little bit more uh, uncomfortable for people one of the things we often remind people to do is just basically to check their basic documents so I'm not saying you'll ever need it but actually it's a good time to double check that your you know your passport's in order you're not in your last six months check that your visas are in order and uh, I speak as somebody you know given my background it's slightly embarrassing you know we turned up at the airport once where one of the children's passport had actually expired because they only last for five years and mentally you assume they last for 10 years so it's that type of thing a very practical measure but something that people can do not to suggest for one minute they absolutely need to do it but it's as good a time as any just to make sure that you've got you know all your housekeeping in order thanks great thank you yeah okay no, not not um a hundred percent uh business question but but Interesting, nonetheless, and obviously, uh, UK culture has a, has a huge attraction in Russia. Um, I know you, neither of you work for the British Council, but maybe you might be able to uh, say something about it. Um, uh, what plans are there for organising UK cultural events in 2022? Um, and um, I assume there's a programme of some sort. I'm not sure who um, can take that. Okay, I can I can certainly yeah. I can certainly give it a good a good start. Um, yeah. As you know, yeah, we have got a cultural we have got a cultural section in the embassy, and they've been doing an absolutely fantastic job. I mean, last last week, we had uh, fifteen um, very high profile um, people from the UK coming over from education, from um, academia, um, including from the British Library, a number of vice chancellors from Imperial Cambridge, etc., and engaging really constructively. Um, with their counterparts, the Rector's Union in Russia. Um, we had a great event at um, Umgimo as well, um, with lots of plans for further scientific engagement. The cultural section also has a number of plans um, for the year ahead as well. Um, so we very, very much hope that we can continue with those 
Oop. Is Julius there or is she gone? Seems to have gone. There's a... Yeah. I mean, I can carry on just a little bit. Yeah, okay, if you don't mind, uh, Trevor, yeah, thanks. Not in terms of the, of the programme, because I don't have all of the detail on that, but yeah. just from a, from a DIT perspective, it's just to uh, be blown away. We do have a dedicated team back in London who deal with, I mean, it's, it's, it's under the banner of creative industries. So that's very much around the film and TV. And, you know, so, so, so the UK soft power uh, is one of our biggest exports around the world, certainly in terms of, you know, say music, film, uh, TV series and so on and so forth. And, and the related support industries that go with it in terms of the technical provision, special effects, all that type of thing. So it's, it's, it's an area for, for DIT on the trade side that we are very uh, interested in and, and, and want to do. We want to do more and we do a certain amount in Russia, certainly not as much as I'd like us to do, but uh, it's an area where I think there is uh, potential. We've been doing some work around museums, for example, another area where there's been some good collaboration. Uh, you'll have seen certainly in my time here, sort of, you know, uh, Russian uh, exhibit exhibitions going to the UK and some, some of the UK ones coming here. Uh, and soft power, uh, cultural relationships is a, is a safe area pretty much for everybody. So, so certainly one that we're very keen to encourage. People to people links are probably for all of us people to people along with the business links are, are hugely important to, to any bilateral relationship that we have uh, they break down some of the barriers uh, and that's why it's so important to us thanks thanks trevor uh, and and i suppose it, on on the th on the same theme um qbp is is a, a highlight in i know is a highlight in the embassy uh, calendar and, and enjoyed by much of the uh British community in Moscow, um, and sadly because of uh, coronavirus, uh, you've been unable to uh, run it for the last couple of years. Um, are you optimistic for this year? <laughs> I am, but I, I always am, as you might imagine. Yeah, I think exactly. if we're looking at sort of May and June, clearly what's happening, I think, you know, as far as sort of the COVID situation here is concerned, it seems to be, you know, following the same trend as elsewhere, certainly in the UK. Yeah. Uh, you know, ha having got COVID myself over the Christmas period, there was a bit of a peak around that time, and it seems to be sort of, you know, fading. So, so fingers crossed that's what will happen in Russia. Russia was the same, I think, last time when uh, the Delta wave came in, it was probably a month or so behind where we were in the UK. It kind of moves east. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so I think if Russia is sort of peaking now, then I would hope that by the time we get into sort of, you know, March, April, May, that the, uh, the worst of COVID has passed here, in which case more, you know, offline events, person to person events, people to people, face to face events and bigger events are, uh, you know, are feasible and certainly something that we would be very, very keen to do, not just on the scale of the QBP, but receptions, um, evenings, you know, bar evenings, things like that for 50, 60 people, stuff that we've not been able to do over the last year or so, hopefully some of that will come back on again on stream again and we'll be able to deliver a lot more events with a lot more people and the qbp would be you know the jewel in the crown for that thanks great thank you okay well i'm, I'm pretty much uh, through the uh, questions obviously julia's dropped off so so we can oh no i've managed to join oh, back you're in back. On my phone. apologies i'm not quite sure what happened to my computer but it gave up the will to live so sorry about that no that's fine uh, so, so Trevor just covered the the, the um, cultural aspect uh, um, Brilliant. quite comprehensively. So, uh, I, I think we, we we had a good answer on that. Um, one of my final questions, um, and and it's a little bit sort of uh, I know difficult to answer, but um, it asks in the case of increased tension over the Ukraine situation. Are there any practical measures the embassy could do to protect British business? I'm, I'm not thinking physical, I, I suspect it's, it's just uh, on the diplomatic side. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm happy to, go on. So, so I'm happy to take that out to a certain yeah. extent or part of it, in, in, in as much as, you know, events like this this is why we're very keen to sort of work with you to deliver this type of event yeah. uh, you know obviously we're we're giving a lot of information how out, out and hopefully it's all very useful to people but equally we're very keen to hear back from people because you know sometimes we don't you know see things necessarily in the same way and if people don't alert us to issues then we won't know so so very happy to hear from people if, they, if there are practical things that they're concerned about um, and if we know about them then we can uh, consider them and look to see what we might be able to do to help but we don't always know but certainly the outreach is a very very important part of it to try and better understand you know what the issues are you know we're sort of raising obviously you know health certification and all that type of type of thing so so good to know as much as possible from the business community and hear back either direct or, or through you uh, in case there are things that we're missing because you know and, and even if people think it's well everyone would know that i wouldn't necessarily assume that's the case because you know we might you know, there might be things out there that we're not aware of but would certainly appreciate uh, knowing about if, if people are prepared to share 
Great, thank you. Um, that's all questions I have. Um, I'll go to the audience. Um, is there any final questions, uh, given that we've got a couple of minutes left? Um, is there any questions left? I, there's a couple of questions in the chat, but I suspect you, you missed the, um, the, the answers to them in the earlier part. Um, the webinar will be recorded and, and uh, put on the website, so you'll be able to look back. Um, but for the, uh, to, to save um, repeating uh, ourselves, I, I won't go back over that, those particular questions that have already been answered. Uh, there was just one that I, I noticed that I might just say oh, a little bit do, more yeah, if, thank you, you. if you don't mind if I just say of very course. quickly. So, yeah. Someone asked a question about um, recognizing Russia's security concerns and okay. uh, mentioning situations like Afghanistan. So I, I thought yeah. it was just worth picking up because I think um, about the uh, about the constructive um, areas where we are able to work with Russia and we mm -hmm. we absolutely need to understand Russia's concerns if we're if we're to properly um, both uh, resolve the Ukraine situation, but also work with them on other areas. So Afghanistan is actually quite a good area where we are working with Russia and we are looking at how we manage the broader international risks from, from, from what's happened recently in Afghanistan. Um, climate change is another area. We've had fantastic engagement with Russia over the last year. So I don't want to paint an overly negative picture because of the tensions over Ukraine. We've had engagement. The ambassadors met ministers at the most senior level. We've had ministers coming here to talk about climate change and obviously a really successful delegation from Russia to Glasgow and a lot of progress um, that both the Prime Minister and President Putin acknowledged when they spoke in December about how constructive the engagement had been. So I, I just wanted to emphasise that there are, as well as the business side, there are other really positive and constructive areas where we are engaging um, with Russia, who is an important important country in the world, um, not least because it's a UN Security Council member, but also because of the, the huge um, land and um, uh, assets and history and culture that, that, it, that it has. Um, thank you very much. And, and I think that's a, a perfect place to, to stop uh, on a positive note for a change. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Julia Crouch, Deputy Head of Mission and, and Trevor Lewis, Head of DIT, um, very much for joining us today, for giving us that very valuable update. Um, I, I think during this period of increased tension, we'll, we'll try and do these pretty regularly because I know people are obviously very concerned about the situation. Um, appreciate you giving up your time to do that. So thank you. Um, for everyone else, um, thank you for joining us today. I'd just like to uh, use the opportunity to make a quick RBCC plug. Um, please join us on the 15th of February when we have a, a fantastic event planned. Uh, we're doing it jointly with um, the American Chamber and the French uh, at the Marriott on Noviard Bat. Should be a great event. Uh, you can register online and uh, we very much hope to see you there. But um, in the meantime, thank you very much for joining. Uh, in London, good morning. In Moscow, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Al. Bye. Thank you, Trevor. Bye.